Right, yes, we are starting. Um, so let me introduce uh, tonight's speaker. Um, Alan Fitzgerald started his career um, through an engineering apprenticeship and he became a design engineer in the machine tool industry, working mostly on CNC machines. He later joined Computer Vision to provide CAD CAM systems uh, and then moved into IT. Um, uh, with, and that included spells with Oracle um, and in Centegra. He took early retirement, but it obviously didn't suit him because after three years, um, he joined Kingston University, where among other things, he helped to develop a work-based learning M MSc. Um, he later joined Aston University and he took that experience um, uh, as a supervisor for their MSc in professional engineering. Um, that experience makes him very well qualified to talk about this degree program tonight. He's been a member of IMECE for more than 50 years, and he served on a number of IMECE committees during that time. So uh, I am now going to put his slides up, hopefully. Okay, so if you'd like to request control, Alan. Okay. That should allow you. And over to you to kick us off. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Brian, and good evening, everybody. Thank you for uh, attending this webinar. I hope you find it interesting. It's about work-based engineering, a term that might be new to uh, some of you. And tonight I want to talk about the programme itself and some of my experiences in running the programme in the UK and overseas in some, uh, some fairly exotic places. So hopefully um, I have control now and the way we sort of go. <laughs> it's happening again, Brian, I'm afraid. The slide's not moving on. Ah, right. OK, let's go back. OK, I think we have it now. Yep, we're on. OK, OK, work based learning. It's um, it's still quite a new way of learning for many people, but it's, uh, it, it is gaining in popularity and it is a very, I think, very effective and alternative way of delivering learning by the student focusing on industry problems rather than just a set curriculum of study. It takes a while to get your head around the concepts because one of the questions that people ask is, OK, so what are you going to teach me? And the answer is, well, I'm not going to teach you anything. I'm going to show you how to learn. And that kind of uh, makes for an interesting conversation to start with. But as um, it combines the best features of apprenticeship, mentoring and remote learning, and it is academically rigorous because it's run by the same people who teach on the taught learning MSCs. And it does produce a very well-rounded and professional engineering. Professional engineer, which is why we call it a professional engineering master's degree. It's traditionally been used in vocational training um, for a number of years now. It's been it's been used a lot in nursing. It's certainly used in some of the military. It's found its way into apprenticeships and it's now establishing itself in postgraduate education. I wouldn't say it's there yet. It's got a long way to go, but it's certainly establishing itself now. It's basically a three to five year MSc degree, part time, 
and is designed to allow students to demonstrate the required academic levels of learning and competences necessary to become chartered engineers. It's based around real company issues and every individual program is unique. And it's for this reason that it's very difficult for professional engineering institutions to accredit it as an MSc because every single individual is on a unique program. It's quite a difficult concept to get over to people sometimes, but everyone is different. Even people working in the same companies, uh, even in the same departments, are doing essentially different programs. The history of it goes back to effectively about 2007 when Engineering Council initiated a pilot program and this program was led by Kingston University assisted by three other universities and that initial program started off with about 50 students. Kingston recruited 40 students, the other three universities managed 10 between them so you can sort of see who was driving the program. Today, there's been a total of about 400 students registered on the programs worldwide. And we have graduates from the UK, Angola, Indonesia and Azerbaijan. Strange places to have graduates from, you might be asking yourself, but I think it will become clear as we go through the rest of the talk. So, key features of the programme itself. All programmes are conducted in English language. We don't offer the programme in any other languages. It is suitable, but we just don't do that. As I mentioned, there's no formal curriculum. And there's also no planned taught elements. There's also no final exam. However, there is a viva at the end. And as well as that, module assignment reports, and there's about nine of them to do, uh, have to be passed all through the programme. So it's rather like continuous assessments. They have to, in order to get to the end, they have to pass each of the modules. And like any other standard master's programme, it earns them credits. And to get a an MSc in this country, you need 180 credits. Participants are visited around four times a year by a professional supervisor. Currently, that's not possible because of the pandemic. So we've now switched it to video conferencing with them every month. And once or twice a year by their academic supervisor. One thing about the academic supervisors, they don't have to come from Aston University. We have a number of other supervisors from other universities across the UK that we can call on. The participant has to be very self-motivated. And this is something which is quite hard to get over to individuals who join the program that it's very different from an undergraduate degree, a bachelor's degree, where essentially they absorb knowledge and they regurgitate it and it comes, you know, they have to pass the exam. This way, the participant has to be self-motivated because it's his program or her program. And the whole point of it is that we, if they don't want to work very hard, the program takes them longer. Most important thing from the company's viewpoint is that the students or participants in the program carry on with their day job. So again, that makes it quite a difficult program to do, which is why it takes three years. Three years at a minimum. So we have some key requirements for participating students. It's the best, really, the entry point is the first degree doesn't particularly matter what subject, but obviously a mathematical or science or engineering first degree is preferred. But we also say or equivalent because we believe that experience 
equates to academic ability in some senses. Uh, it's very difficult to re refuse someone with 25 years experience just because they haven't got a degree. Um, I think we're one of the few programmes that takes that experience into account. One of the key things we look for is enthusiasm. If they're going to be self-motivated, they have to be enthusiastic as well. Importantly, they have to be able to self-manage. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this is their program. We want them to effectively run the program. We will encourage them, but we don't. Uh, we don't have the power to make them do anything. It's basically adult learning, so we expect them to behave like adults. We want them to have a strong desire to become more professional, and most people joining the program want to do this because it satisfies the academic requirements for chartership. They still have to go through the PEI interviews. That's nothing to do with Aston, but we will prepare them. As you probably know, you, you don't get really asked to a PEI interview unless you've already satisfied the academic requirements. We want them to be goal oriented. Now, the structure of the programme itself looks somewhat complicated at first sight, but if you start from the left hand side, there's an opening module called personal development audit. And there's a learning agreement, there's an evaluative review and a competence development action programme. That's all, if you like, setting up the programme. They then move into. Compulsory modules, usually, first of all, those are the ones in brown or orange on your screens. And there's uh, there's probably three of them at the start. And you can do these in parallel as long as you don't try to do too many in parallel. The grade modules are optional and you have to choose four of those from a list of about nine. Uh, at the, the last year is taken up with a final major module assignment. And then there's the Viva. If they pass that, they get the master's degree. Then they have to apply to become a chartered engineer. The time span across the fastest we've ever had someone do this was 30 months. Uh, the longest <laughs> we've had a couple exceed the 60 months, but we don't. Um, there was exceptional circumstances on that. So that's the structure of the program. That's the way it's uh, been developed over the last. We've been running it now for 12 or 13 years. Some of the companies that have been involved with us on this are quite well known household names. People like Salsa, Amec, BP, BMW, Network Rail, Exxon. Uh, mainly large companies, but we have had a few smaller ones. Um, but by and large, they tend to be fairly large companies that uh, recognize the value of this and encourage some of their middle management staff to go on the program. So what 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 have you learned from doing it in the UK? IMACE themselves have commented now in the last couple of years on the very high standard of professionalism of the students we put forward for their CNG interviews. Part of the reason for that is the average age is probably around 32. But we accept onto the program anybody from the ages of about 24 ish. So what we want them to have is three or four years uh, post undergraduate experience up to I think our oldest individual was 65. An individual who <laughs> owned three companies, flew his own helicopter, but he just liked the sound of the program. He certainly wasn't looking for promotion or anything like that because he already had it. The nice thing is we do have females on this. I wish we had more. It's about three to one ratio at the moment. The dropout rates are around 15 to 20 percent, which is standard for any master's program. 
And the reason for the dropouts is vary, but the main one is they find it difficult to cope with self-management. Their personal circumstances might change. They, um, they might change their job. If they change their job, that's not an issue with our program. You can effectively take this program uh, from job to job. And we have had, I've had one student who over the three years worked for three different companies. And I had another student who not only changed companies, but she changed continents. And I supported her in Angola, London, Singapore, uh, Japan and Indonesia. Challenging, but uh, <laughs> we do support them when they start the programme. Uh, many students gain promotion during their programmes. Um, on average, at least one promotion in the three year period. One of my examples later on will show something even more spectacular than that. OK, I'd like to talk a little bit about Angola experiences now. We spent five years running the programme over there and it's a very interesting place. We visited there working with BP Angola, assisting them on what's called their nationalisation programme. In order for BP to get the licence to operate in Angola, they have to agree to bring along their key nationals, employ them and position them in senior positions so that the expats who start off in BP Angola can be sent back home and their jobs are taken over by the local individuals. We worked with them in Luanda, which is the capital, but the drilling platforms are about 100 miles offshore in very, very deep water, uh, as deep as the Gulf of Mexico, 2000 metres. And that presents new unique challenges, as you'll see later on. That's what's called a floating platform and storage operation. It's basically an oil tanker with an oil derrick on it. And the beauty of this is that it's um, it's not a derrick that's anchored to the seabed. It's a bit difficult to anchor something 2000 metres down. So it's uh, kept on position by GPS and uh, effectively a whole range of propellers around it. The interesting thing about this, of course, it can be positioned anywhere. So once you started building it, if you've exhausted that particular well, you can sort of up sticks and drive on to the next place. That operation there runs about 120 staff. It's a 300,000 ton dead weight, produces about 150,000 barrels of oil a day, and it stores nearly 2 million barrels, and also processes natural gas as well. A very impressive piece of machinery. Even more impressive is the area that that floating point storage operation vessel covers. If you look on that, you can see the lines going down to the seabed. All of the equipment on the seabed has to be assembled by robot submarines. These things down here, these are all the uh, equipment to enable the drilling. Uh, these are all the sizes of <laughs> houses. They're huge. Um, even to, you, this is far too deep for divers. So everything is remote. Everything is done by remote. And you can see on this one, there are 35 separate subsea pipelines going into the FPSO. It covers an area, one vessel covers an area of a thousand square kilometers. So the technology, the communications, everything about this particular way of mm, drilling for oil is really quite spectacular. And a lot of my students were involved in doing work, either assembling uh, or on the actual FPSOs themselves. 
Uh, Angola, as some of you probably know, a former Portuguese colony for 250 years, took us a long time to understand the culture of the students. It's very much out of sight, out of mind. They're, they're lovely people, they're great people. They, uh, and they promise you all sorts of things when you visit there. But the minute you get on the plane to go back to England, you've effectively left their universe. <laughs> you don't exist anymore. So it's, it's, it took us a while to figure out how to, how to counter that sort of uh, culture. They have long commutes to work. Public transport is not very good. Uh, but Luanda, for a number of years, was the most expensive capital on Earth. Um, it's always in a firefighting state, the oil and gas industry. If one of those vessels goes offline for any reason, and they do have to shut down once a year for a weekly turnaround, they lose effectively $10 million a day in lost revenue. So fairly serious, big business. Uh, Angolans love their music and partying. They like nothing better. Okay, Indonesia. We went there in 2011. Um, it's, it's a country of extreme contrasts. 260 million people, vast, 10,000 islands on the, on the archipelago. It's located in a very um, <laughs> difficult part of the world on the, in the Ring of Fire. Volcanoes, earthquakes and floods are sort of commonplace, as is, as is extreme poverty. You can see that's a photograph of the uh, local river in, in Jakarta. The BP engineering office, again, these were for nationalisation programmes. The office is in Jakarta and the liquid natural gas plant was in Tengu, West Papua. 2,000 kilometers away. As you can see down here, Jakarta is in Java, Tangu is right over here in Papua New Guinea. Indonesia is the world's largest Muslim country, but it's very, cult very multicultural with a huge mix of Buddhist Christians as well. Hundreds of ethnic groups, they speak 300 languages, and the thing which made it very difficult for us because their education system discourages questioning. So if we say anything to them when they go out there, we're never sure if they really understand. It's very difficult for them to admit any lack of understanding or face, as you probably understand it from maybe Chinese. The uh, Jakarta traffic was legendary. Um, and as for thunderstorms, they are quite amazing. <laughs> this is a, a view of Tangu, West Papua. It was literally carved from the jungle. It started in 2009 and it was the world's largest LNG field for several years. In 2016, BP approved an $8 billion expansion to it to double the output to 11 million tonnes. The natural gas is uh, drilled for just offshore, not as far offshore as in Angola, just offshore and piped into the processing plant, which you can see there. Many of the assignments that the participants, my students did, were connected to this site. Finally, Azerbaijan, we went there in 2014 and we were there for a number of years. Um, population is only about 9 million people. However, as was evidenced by their recent war, there is about a million people uh, annexed to the West and probably 20 million people were absorbed back into Iran some years ago. So there's a lot more Angola, uh, Azerbaijanis, but Azerbaijan as it stands today is only about 9 million people. The capital is Baku, which you can see a picture of there. 
extraction. There is some extraction onshore, uh, but not a great deal now. Most of it's in the Caspian Sea. They're very European in outlook, amazingly so. And again, they have another one of these nationalization programs. In fact, our first overseas graduate was a young lady from Baku. Interestingly enough, engineering at some of the universities in Azerbaijan is only taught in English. That it took me a long time to get my head around that. It was quite amazing. They have a very high female representation in industry and business. It's about 50 50. Some of you might know that the word Azerbaijan means land of fire and the national symbol is a flame. And these three buildings here, as you can see, I hope on the bottom right picture, are called the flame towers. <clears throat> Don't look very spectacular now, but at night time they project red and orange and yellow flames onto these flame towers and they're quite amazing. These are about 25 stories high. Uh, these things flicker <laughs> for hours in the evenings. Quite an amazing place. Originally it was part of Iran, but there's also very strong Turkish and Russian influences. In fact, it was part of USSR twice. It's a Muslim country and another dictatorship, same as Angola. Um, I've already got, yes, the culture there is highly artistic. Poetry, art and music are the things that really turn them on. But it has a long history of mathematics and science. You can see some very early pictures of oil developments there. In fact, an awful lot of the oil industry's early practices were developed in Azerbaijan. I, I once had a memorable taxi ride there. I showed the local taxi driver a business card, a BP business card, and he said, oh, fine. And we got in the taxi and off we drove. Trouble is, he actually deposited me in the middle of an oil field. He saw the word BP immediately thought of the oil field, which was about five miles outside Baku, and drove me there. Uh, he didn't take any notice of the address on the business card because uh, their language is, they don't use English language. Cyrillic, is it? I think it's Cyrillic language. Baku has a number of, a number like 25 five-star hotels, and it has shops to die for. And of course, it also now has a Grand Prix, which is interesting. If you watch the Grand Prix, you get a pretty good idea of what Baku looks like. The gas from Azerbaijan and the Caspian crosses into Europe this way. There's huge pipelines. And the reason it has to have pipelines is the Caspian Sea is landlocked and below sea level. So it, you know, it, it would give a, a 300,000 ton vessel a bit of a problem. Smaller ones, maybe five or 10,000 tons, can get out of the north of the Caspian, up the Volga River into Russia. But that's fine for sort of small things, but not much good if you're trying to export 300,000 tons of oil every day. Oil has been used as trade there as early as the third and fourth centuries. And it was exporting kerosene for lamps in the 15th century by camels along the Silk Road. So if anybody has a claim to fame for inventing the oil industry, it's Azerbaijan and not Texas. OK, I thought I'd finish up with a, a couple of examples of the sort of major projects that the students get uh, involved in doing. This one is called OTEC. It's a technology that's uh, becoming interesting now. It's ocean thermal energy conversion, and that's a picture of a plant. I think that particular one is in Japan. But um, I mentioned that there were 10,000 islands in Indonesia. 
In fact, you can see this sort of thermal picture. Orange and yellow are hot. Everything else is cool. It's in a very hot region along the equator. That's important because most of the islands currently depend on diesel generators, which is not particularly good. 60 million people have no access to electricity at all. And this uses the Carnot cycle principles, utilizing the temperature difference between cold water and the warm water at the ocean surface. So it's a little bit like heat pumps, either ground source heat pumps or air source heat pumps. It's the same sort of principles. But it is being looked at very seriously. And my student on this sits on one of the um, committees in Indonesia now, which is developing this. Uh, yeah, she's a deputy chair for the region's OTEC steering group. And it all came for her from her final year project. Right, more traditional engineering. One of the students did a very good uh, project on cavitation. Um, it's a very misunderstood uh, thing, cavitation. It was focused on the design issues and surface degradation. Uh, you can't really see here, but you can see when things start to cavitate, behaves rather different. And then if you modify the impeller design, which is what he did, uh, it made the flow much smoother. It stopped the cavitating. If you hadn't done that, this is what a pump looks like when it's been <laughs> attacked by cavitation seriously. Interesting, we do like to have a whole variety of different engineering projects for them. So these are all real world, real world problems. This one was quite interesting. It was, um, you can see that rather expensive looking yacht there with the uh, lights underneath. Oh, those lights are all made by a British company. Uh, the individual was when we, when he started the program, he was a technical manager. Um, when I did this slide, he has been promoted. This was, he, he graduated about three years ago. Yeah, about three years ago. He, he was a technical director. He's now their group managing director. So in the space of four years from being, from when he graduated, he's now got group managing director. But he used this looking at uh, various manufacturing methods. He had a greater understanding of how to do new product introduction. That was his final year project on his masters. They're not all complicated. I use this one as a good example because this company in the Midlands manufactured thin walled tubes and had to weld them. Um, it was all to do with uranium processing, reprocessing. And the company had major problems with weld failure. And uh, the student wanted to do a project around this to try and see if he could fix the problems. He didn't just recommend new technology. It, must, it would be very tempting for him to say, OK, we need to buy new machines, et cetera, et cetera. He didn't. He said, no, I want to have a look at the whole process and see if I can have marginal improvements, which together will go towards fixing the problem. And this is what he did. It took him about nine, ten months. And he got a 50 percent reduction to four percent. 1500 tubes a week. So he saved the company tens of thousands of pounds just by looking at the processes, the engineering processes themselves, nothing really to do with technology. He focused on training, uh, cleanliness, welding parameters, positioning alignments, all the things that are really important in engineering. This is one I really do like. This was done by one of my students. He's, in fact, he's a Brit, but he was working in Azerbaijan. That's a picture of uh, a drilling platform floor, the drilling floor. Probably, in all seriousness, one of the most dangerous places on Earth. All the equipment on there has what they call software-based anti-collision systems. 
So as various machines come into play, all, all these hard machines avoid each other. If one enters in the workspace of another machine, it stops. But it makes no allowance for soft objects such as humans. So the control systems crack the problem with smashing up machinery, but people were still at risk, at great risk as well. This particular project prototyped radio frequency identification transponders. And uh, we suggested that they put them on the helmets because that's the one thing uh, all the drilling operators always wear. They always wear a helmet, no matter what. <laughs> so we put the transponders in there and the receivers were placed around the, uh, the floor of the rig. And that those signals were then integrated with some special software into the anti-collision software of the machines themselves. So this actually worked. He came over to this country and demonstrated it at Aston University. And as far as I know, um, there's companies now vying to buy this technology to include it in the standard software anti-collision systems. So that one was commercial, solved a real problem and saved lives. The final major one was the dismantling of a French nuclear plant. Uh, a fairly non-trivial exercise, I'm sure you'll agree. Uh, it was a pan-European workforce, so the student had to work in multiple languages using complex project management. Risk analysis was really essential <clears throat> and it took, it took nearly three years to complete. Excuse me. So where next? <clears throat> well, as well as offering the, the master's program, we're now doing two year degree apprenticeships. And we've currently started them for Bentley Motors in Crewe, Seven Trent Water, the BBC and Northern Telecoms. Uh, the same sort of ideas behind it. In fact, what we do, we take the first two years of our three year master's program. And this is what their two year degree apprenticeships are. And if they want to, once they've been awarded their apprenticeship, they can do the third year and complete the master's as well. So that's a, a quick run through of uh, MSc Professional Engineering. Hopefully there'll be some questions for me. And I'll now hand back control, I think, to Brian. Is that okay now, Brian? Brian? Uh, sorry about that. Thank you for prompting me. Uh, so thank you very much, Alan. Um, there, I've already got some questions coming in, so I'll, I'll start Good. off with the ones that I've got. Um, Somebody here is saying, I am currently doing a degree apprenticeship and I've finished my degree and in the process of heading to endpoint assessment, is this transferable in terms of credit learning or are they entirely different? I, I'm assuming this is a first degree apprenticeship. Well, well there are there there are undergraduate apprenticeships and there are postgraduate apprenticeships. What I've just been talking about is a postgraduate apprenticeship. Yeah, I think this is an under this is a, a first degree apprenticeship. In which case, I think the answer would be no. If perchance it is a postgraduate one and depending upon the subject, it's possible that some of those credits could count towards yep. the MSc. There is a second uh, question, which is why I think this is a, a first degree. Um, the question is, does your does the first degree have to be a first class degree or could it be a two one? It could be what, anything. As long as, 
the, the only requirement is a degree. We don't specify a class. Thank you. And then uh, next questions. Um, are the modules approved individually uh, as they are pursued or as a block? What we encourage them to do, as I mentioned right back at the beginning of uh, that diagram of the program, there's a period of time where they develop what's called the learning agreement. And that learning agreement does specify the first two years worth of modules. We don't ask them to specify the final year until later on in the program. But once we can approve their first two years worth, they're free to go. OK, um, who approves the content? It's a, it's a joint approval. Um, it, it's like a three way one. The student themselves who proposes it, their supervisors and the company. And it's an iterative process. It's not just a one shot. They, we go round and round. Discussing it and reaching a consensus and agreement. As is an academic program, obviously Aston has the, shall we say, the final say, but we really do um, encourage discussion with the company and the student as well. OK, and then um, to what extent is academic content necessary? Uh, and I suspect, knowing who has asked that question, it's, it's really a question between technical and um, sort of managerial commercial, the balance between the various elements. If you go back to what I said originally, the whole point of this programme was to develop learnings and competencies to become chartered engineers. So it's it's not really business related. Some of the programs, some of the modules, they are they can do business analysis, but the whole emphasis is professional engineering, and it's aimed at chartership. So not so much business. Okay. Um, I can see uh, some questions in chat. So uh, for, can somebody register for this MSc without necessarily having a company to develop their projects with? In other words, it, would you be able to have fire, help um, a student find a, com a company um, to develop this, as, as is, has, happens with an engineering doctorate? We've never had one in 12 years, and I don't suspect we would encourage someone to come along without a company. It can be a small company. Um, we had in the early days uh, someone from a company of four people. But a, but a person without the company, I don't think is going to work. No, fine. Um, how does the uh, course cover the three elements um, that uh, IMECE look for in terms of further learning? That is technical deepening, uh, technical broadening and non-technical broadening. Basically, we use UK spec as the guiding document in everything that we do for this programme. And UK spec is the guiding document to become chartered engineers. So the two things are very much aligned. Our learning programme is equivalent to the IMEC's further learning programme. Um, can I, um, as I'm ex-chair of uh, Academic Assessment Committee, can I chip in there and say that we would normally strongly advise um, students to apply to get their uh, learning programme approved by Academic Assessment Committee at an early stage in their course so that they know once it is complete, then it will meet all of the criteria. Yeah, in fact, Brian, we send the learning agreements to IMECE in the first year of the programme yes. for comment. And in the early days, we had a lot of discussion with IMECE 
Uh, we've, we've had no discussion for years now. I think they're pretty well happy with it, Brian. OK, good. Um, what's the success rate of people passing uh, the MSC and going on to achieve CN status? Do you know? I can't give you exact figures. I was looking at my personal figures. I, I think I've had about 26 graduates in the last 10 years. And of that, I think, uh, remember, these are not always IMECE either, because no. we, we cover all the professional engineering institutions. I suppose about 60% uh, have gone on to become chartered. Some of them, we've asked them, have you applied? And they have said, well, no, I'm not interested. So it's their choice. We can't make them. We've also had people on the programme who were already chartered, but liked the programme so much, they still wanted to do it. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it is a good way of developing your competence um, in terms of uh, achieving your goals in your job. Absolutely, absolutely is. Yeah. Um, OK, another question here. Do we need to get our company's approval prior to applying to, to join your program? I think the answer is probably yes. For the simple reason is that most of the of students um, that we have, the companies will pay the fees. Not all, yeah. but 90, I'd say 95 percent pay the fees. So it's a fairly big incentive to have the company behind you. Not only that, we want the company to work with the student on the programme by allowing them some time to do the work. It shouldn't be that, you know, you've got your day job and you go home at night and weekends and you're doing this. The whole point of it, it was an integrated program based on that company's problems. OK, sorry, I'll, <laughs> I've got things firing at me from several <laughs> areas at the moment. You're doing a friend job, Brian. <laughs> yeah, um, so um, how do people apply to to um, start on the, uh, the degree course with you? Just go to the Aston University website and type in professional engineering. OK, that's a very simple answer. <clears throat> Um, can you share module descriptors for the core modules? So what do the core modules cover? I mean, I, um, OK, they are the, the four subjects of the core modules are current technology, emerging technology, design methodology. Uh, those are the three core modules. And the major project is also core. It's only make, it's only core because they they have to be done. Yep. But within that, it covers a whole multitude of situations because emerging technology in any engineering discipline, from electrical to plant design, manufacturing, um, civil engineering. So it's a very wide range. We. We deliberately keep the, shall we say, the uh, the things very general because it has to cover all engineering disciplines. Yeah, yeah. But those those core modules, um, what what uh, the individual student actually uh, looks at will depend on their particular role and their particular industry, won't it? Yes, it, it will. It's not a general descriptor no no but you know if if you got if you got someone who's working in mechanical engineering their current technologies could be very different from somebody working in electrical engineering yes which is different again from air, from aeronautical engineering yeah but the principle is still current oh, technology. principles the same but 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 um, there aren't a series of topics uh, which I think is what is maybe being imagined here is that, you know, you're going to look at this particular topic. No, no, no. no. that's the beauty that's... of it. It's, it's, 
we get them to define what do you want to learn? Um, which which links on to the next question, which is, I'm a, an HVAC senior engineering manager. Can I select modules on HVAC systems only? Who will design the modules? The modules are set by Aston University. What you do within the module to satisfy the requirements is between you, the company and your supervisor. But I think the answer is yes, all of the modules could have an HVAC focus. Absolutely, absolutely do. I mean, HVAC these days is, is quite a wide uh, range of technologies anyway. So it certainly is. I, I started in it, Brian, as you pointed out. <laughs> yeah. Um, how does um, the cost compare to undertaking a traditional master's on a part time basis? It works out about the same. I, I mean, I can't give you a chapter and verse on the cost. No, but I, I mean, if it's, it's about the same, it's it, about it, the it, same. Then it's down, yeah. Spread over three okay. years. Um, I don't understand this one. Does this course require IELTS score? Is that an English language qualification? Ah, uh, could could well be. It, it well. Yes, I'm told. Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the ability in the English language. It has to be pretty good, yes. I can't remember the exact number it has to qualify, but my examples, you know, we went to Indonesia, Azerbaijan, Angola. They all spoke English because English is the universal language of the oil industry. Yeah, I mean, it's probably going to be similar to if you were undertaking a traditional master's. Yes, it would be. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, what's the course fee structure? I think this is not, this is not, um, is it, is it an annual fee or is there a? Yes, a, a yes it is, sorry. Yes, it's, okay. you pay, I think it's every September, you pay for the next year. We, we take people onto the programme uh, four times a year. But okay. the actual administrative of the money is once a year in September. It's, it, it's, it's a university, Brian. They can't work in any other way. <laughs> <laughs> OK, somebody, uh, well, the, 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 the person who asked the, the original question has come back and said, what is the minimum score for the IELTS? Um, I and I am assuming that uh, they don't know. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I don't know that. But, you know, remember, You've got to be writing your reports in English. And they're going to be marked by essentially English people. So if your if your English language is no good, you can't communicate very well with your supervisor. You probably can't define the problem very well that you're going to try and solve. So it's kind of self-regulating in that sense. Um, I am told, uh, coming up in the chat, uh, there is a link to um, your MSc on the Aston University site. So if anyone is interested, have a look at the chat. Um, and it also gives you a link to find the language requirements. That Thank happens. you. <laughs> I will look at it myself later. <laughs> um, who will be the course supervisor from the company or university or IMECE? Well, it's not IMECE. It it's is. not the company. No. Not the company. Most companies or many companies will have a mentor. And our supervisors will work with the company mentor. But the mentor is not there to do the work or argue about the work. He's there to support the student. OK. Um, we, I think I've run out of questions unless of immediate questions. I'm very so, impressed with the standard of questions. It's very good. Yeah. Ah. Um, 
what happens if if there is not a suitable mentor in the company? Have you have you? No, doesn't matter. If there is one, we work with them. If there isn't one, so what? Um, can can you help um, by sort of uh, providing a mentor from elsewhere? No, we would look to, the, for example, the IMEC to do that. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> We're providing the supervisors, Brian. <laughs> yes, no, I I agree. I just wondered whether you had sort of alumni or. Uh... No, we don't. I'm sorry. Uh, then who will be mentor and supervisor? I uh, don't understand that. No. Remember, at the core at, at the core of this, this program is an academic master's degree. Yes. So a company mentor has nothing to do with that. The company mentor is there like a best friend for the student to help, yes. to guide. Nothing to do with the programme. No, I mean, it, it would be very useful to have a mentor, um, but it isn't essential. Absolutely. Um, true. And it, you can certainly go through. Um, so it, it is say, mentor and supervisor are different, I think, is, is the answer to the question. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think yeah. um yeah, okay, um, what would be a typical time investment complete um the program in three years, sort of hours per week okay average. that's a good question. um I mentioned it's a hundred and eighty credits, and experience says you need to spend ten hours per credit. So you need 1,800 hours over three years, 600 hours a year, about 11 hours a week, every week. And that's it. But that's an average. Some people are very fast, some people are very slow. But that is a good guide. OK, thank you very much. Just see if there are any more questions going to pop up. I uh, remember, as I said, if you do uh, on reflection, come up with another question, very happy for you to email it to me and I will pass it on to Alan. So I think uh, we will uh, bring things to a stop at that point and I will cease the recording. So I have done that.